bid you welcome to our Bible week as we come to our first night. Let us worship the Lord as we sing together 595. The sands of time are sinking. The dawn of heaven breaks. The summer morn aside for the fair sweet morn awakes.
Some of you may be following what's happening in the world. So as I throw this slide up, you know what it is, don't you? Have you been following the news today? We got word from uh, Mrs. Kearns' niece, who listens in to us, and she's looking forward to seeing this phenomena. It doesn't come very often. We've never seen it before, and we'll never see it again. It's a total eclipse, and millions of people just after 7 o'clock witnessed it in Mexico. This is a natural phenomenon that God has sent. But, you know, I was thinking this week we're looking for the spiritual phenomena, looking for the Lord to come, the Spirit of God to move, and to really bless our meetings, our time together. So we're going to bow together and seek the Lord in prayer and call upon his name. We've been much in prayer for the Bible conference and for the Lord's servant as he comes to conduct the meetings night by night, preach the word, We're looking forward to the subject, and the subject tonight, of course, living in the light of eternity. So we want to live that way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we still our hearts in your presence just now, in the all-precious name of the Lord Jesus, the one who came into this world as our Redeemer, who lived for us and died for us at the cross, who paid the price in full, who cried with that note of great victory, it is finished. We rejoice that this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, signifying we know that the work was done. And Lord, we thank you tonight afresh for an accomplished redemption and for what every believer here enjoys in Christ. We thank you for the moment when the transaction took place between us and God, when we received the experience of the new birth, born again of the Spirit, washed in the Redeemer's blood, our sins forever dealt with. We thank Thee for that moment that grace enabled us to turn to Christ, repenting of our sin, and by faith laying hold upon Him as the only Savior. And Lord, You've been with us these years of our Christian experience, We thank you for that in every situation of life, in the ups and downs, in the mountaintop experiences as well as those times we have found ourselves in the valley. And we have proved that thou art the faithful God, the God that keeps his people throughout life, who gives us grace to live the Christian life. And Lord, as we think this week about living for the Lord and tonight living in the light of eternity, come among us, we pray. Show us thy face, lift up the light of thy countenance upon this congregation. And may we know that the Lord is here. We thank you for the one who is the great teacher, the comforter sent by not only the Father, but by the Lord Jesus. He promised that the comforter would come. And Lord, we know there was that manifestation of great power on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came in greater measure than ever before. And Lord, you filled the hearts and the lives of those disciples who were met in the place of prayer. And you began to do wonders there in the city of Jerusalem and further afield. Thank thee for the gospel that has gone to the nations of the world and for the fact that Jesus Christ is is building his church. He's gathering in his people onto himself. And Lord, we thank you for what you've done in our own nation in our own land, in our own churches. And we acknowledge this, the hand of God, the moving of the Spirit, the bringing of men out of sin into the light and the liberty of the gospel. And here we are, uh, most of us tonight, your people, washed and redeemed and saved by grace, and sitting here waiting, hungering, thirsting. And we pray that that will deepen Tonight, as this meeting continues and through the week as the meetings continue, that that sense of longing after God will be felt in our souls and that we will have a hunger for your word. Let us not come to a place like this where the bread of life will be broken, the word of the Lord opened and preached upon, and we just leave the same way. Lord, we want the experience that that Jacob had that night when he laid hold upon the Lord and he wrestled all the night through And he refused to let go until he was blessed. And Lord, he was never the same again. 
Lord, this week could be very crucial to us as a congregation. It's our Bible week. It's a time that is set aside in the calendar of the year, a concentrated time sitting beneath your word. Lord, may we sit at the Savior's feet. May we learn from him. May your servant, the Reverend Higginson, know the special anointing of God tonight and every night this week. Endue him with the Spirit. We pray that you'll empower him. And Lord, as you work right here in the pulpit through your child, Lord, work in the seats of this building, in the hearts and lives of every redeemed child of thine. And should there be any among us who knows not the Savior or others that are listening on on the internet, Lord, speak to them too. Your word is very powerful, quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And you can use the preaching of your word to your glory, not only in blessing your people and edifying us and teaching us and rebuking us, challenging us, whatever the case might be, but Lord, even to the saving of precious souls. Do it for your name's sake and may God be honored for Jesus' sake. Amen. 341, some day will stand before the judgment bower. It's thinking about living in the light of eternity and we're reminded here we're going to stand before the Lord one day. The quick, the risen dead, the Lord will then make known the record there. Our names will all be read. What a joy it is to be able to sing tonight and to say from our hearts, I'll be present when the roll is called. Amen. <laughs> seated what will you answer when your name is called it just might be something like this saved through Jesus blood it's the only way I want to bid you welcome we have very few announcements to make so we do welcome you in the Savior's name those that are here in the meeting and others that are joining us on the internet we welcome the preacher Reverend Higginson he's been booked for a little time to come to this Bible week and the congregation has been in prayer. Uh, we're looking forward to the messages night by night. Uh, you'll see from this slide what uh, the plan is for this week, living in the light of eternity, the life of surrender, the life of supplication, the life of service, life in the spirit. And so night by night, these are the subjects that the Lord's servant will deal with. Brother, you're very welcome uh, to Balamone and to Hebron. And we're going to lose you. 
and let you go. Feel at home, and may the Lord give you liberty, grace, and power. Amen. Well, friends, it's a, a real joy, and I say that sincerely. It's a real joy and privilege uh, for me to be with you for this special week of meetings here in Balamone. And I want to thank your pastor and your session and your committee uh, for the very kind invitation to be with you uh, for this incoming week. I'm so surprised to see so many gathered in tonight. Sometimes whenever the preacher's name is mentioned, especially whenever it's my name, it's not all that appealing. And so I'm glad that you're here in spite of the preacher. And I pray that God will meet you tonight and in this incoming week at the point of need. We are living in days where we long for the Spirit of God to move. And that's the prayer of many of God's people, that God would come with healing in his wings and that there might be times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. And I trust that tonight and in the will of God and the nights that remain through to Friday, that night after night the Spirit of God will really challenge us and speak to our hearts we're so mindful that in this world, time is going by so quickly. And soon we will be in the great eternity. And we want our lives to count for God's glory and for the good of the church and for the souls of men. So let's just read the scriptures now. And we're going to ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians and the chapter number 4. <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. And I think we should read all of this chapter this evening. And let's uh, carefully and prayerfully consider the word of God as we read it together. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost." in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Christ's sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, 
Why we look at the th not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And we know the Lord will bless the reading of his word to all of our hearts tonight. And we want to loosely base our thoughts upon verse 18 of this remarkable portion of God's precious and inspired word. Paul says, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. That means they're fleeting, they're passing, they will perish one day. But rather we look at those things which are not seen, the things which are eternal. The life that counts. And tonight our introductory message is simply living in light of eternity. Let's pray together in these moments. And Bible weeks like this are precious, they're special. And we want the preacher certainly to be hidden behind the cross. Sometimes young people ask me, do you still get nervous when you preach? And the answer to that is definitely yes, especially in the first night of a week of meetings like this. We feel our weakness, our inability, but we're thankful for the Spirit of God. And let's pray that the Spirit of the Lord will come into our midst and uplift the Savior and imprint eternal realities upon our hearts. I encourage you to pray for your own heart and life and for the lives of all gathered in and for this locality and this community that even through the Lord speaking to our hearts, this community might be touched by the grace of God. Let's pray together. Father, we're so blessed and so privileged once again to be found amongst the people of God. We thank thee, O God, we have been singing thy praise already. And we thank thee, Lord, now for the opening of thy precious word and for the reading of it together. And Lord, we thank thee, O God, that thou hast said that we're two or three are met together in the Savior's name. He has promised to be in the midst of his people. And Lord, more than any other thing, we long and we desire and we pray for the conscious sense of the presence of God. Lord, let this not just be another meeting. Save us, O God, from just going through a week of, of ministry meetings and going home again and Maybe, yes, enjoying the fellowship with other believers, but, Lord, our hearts not being touched. Lord, deliver us, O oh God, from just going through the, the format of sitting and listening to a dry sermon. Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God might come, and night after night that our hearts might be touched, and that the Son of God will be exalted. Lord, hide the preacher behind the cross. Let my name, O oh God, and the minds of men and women perish and be forgotten but glorify, exalt, and magnify the name of thy Son. And Lord, enable us to live lives that count in light of eternity. Hear and answer prayer. We ask for the infilling and the anointing of the Spirit of God, for thy glory, for the blessing of thy people, even for the salvation perhaps of some that do not know thee. Lord, hear and answer prayer. We offer it with thanksgiving and with humility, and yet with confidence and faith. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I know that Pastor Eugene Grusa is a name that is very precious in the memory of this congregation. And a good number of years ago, he spoke at our, our church in Coleraine. And while he was making his opening uh, remarks, he made this statement. And it really impacted my life all of those years ago. It's maybe about 12 or 14 years ago now. And he was speaking about a time whenever he was being taken for radical surgery and being taken to the theater. And as he was lying in the trolley and being taken into the theater, as the custom would be for any Christian in a situation like that, he began to pray. And he made this prayer before the Lord. He said, Lord, if you, if you bring me through this surgery, if you touch me and heal me and raise me up again, Lord, I endeavor and I will endeavor never again to be involved in things that just do not matter. And whenever he said that, it really resonated within my heart. How much of my life, how much of my time and devotion and affection 
is given over to things that are maybe legitimate in their place, but really, in light of eternity, do not really matter at all. Lord, if you get me through this surgery and you add on to me a number of years, Lord, I, I will endeavor not to be involved again in things that just do not matter, things that do not count in light of eternity, things that contribute nothing really to the advancement of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ, nothing that betters the souls of men. I want my life to count how much of our time, how much of our money, how much of our talent and our ability and our affection is devoted to things that do not really count or matter in light of eternity. As a young Christian, I was introduced to the writings of a pastor, a preacher by the name of Leonard Ravenhill. And as a young Christian, I devoured his books. The first one I read was called Sodom Had No Bible. Then another one, Why Revival Tarries, Revival God's Way, Revival Praying, Tried and Transfigured, America is Too Young to Die. And I tell you, Leonard Ravenhill's books are easy to read in the sense that the chapters are short, they're captivating, they're not all that deep theologically, there's not a lot of big words in them. They're easy to read in that sense, but they're very difficult to read in the sense that they are so challenging. And recently, a man has written a book on Ravenhill's life, and it's simply entitled, In Light of Eternity. In Light of Eternity. If you were to visit Leonard Ravenhill's grave in Texas, in the United States of America, the dates 1907 to 1994, and then at the bottom of his headstone are the words written, is what you are living for worth Christ's dying for? Are the things that you're living for tonight, are they worth Christ's dying for? Are they worthy of the Savior's name? Are they worthy of the Savior's passion? Are they worthy of the Savior's blood? Beloved, tonight a Christian in the Word of God is supposed to be a person whose life has been radically altered and radically changed by the grace of God. A Christian is a person who has been given a new nature. Sometimes I believe in the church of Jesus Christ for the sake of simplicity. We very much undermine what a Christian really is. We have the idea that a Christian is merely a person who has been forgiven and is on their way to heaven. And praise God, that is what a Christian is, but it is only a small part of what a Christian is. A Christian is a child of God. A Christian is a person who has been given a new nature. In fact, the Bible says we have become partakers of the divine nature. A Christian is a person indwelt by the Spirit of the living God. As Henry Scougal in that book that so influenced John and Charles Wesley, he said a Christian is a person who has got the, the very life of God in the soul of man. The Apostle Paul gave it as his testimony. In Philippians chapter 1, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For to me, now he's thinking about himself, and in making that statement, he's throwing out a challenge as well. For to me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. But therefore, what about you? What about your life? Now, it certainly wasn't always that way for the Apostle Paul or Saul of Tarsus, as he was formerly known. There was a time whenever he hated and despised the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He was a persecutor of the church. He was making his way to Damascus to imprison believers. He had no thought at all of becoming a Christian as far as we know. But somehow, somewhere in the road to Damascus, his life was changed and yielded and surrendered unreservedly into the hand of the one that had been persecuting. What had happened? He was converted. He was born again. And that changed absolutely everything in a moment of time. And from that moment until the moment that he died and went to be with the Savior, having died as a martyr, he was able to say, for to me to live is Christ. I have one purpose in this world. 
And that's to live for the glory of my Savior, for the Christ who shed his blood for me. Now here in 2 Corinthians, obviously Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And if you read 1 Corinthians, it's remarkable reading this young, vibrant New Testament church was a church that was riddled with problems, pride, worldliness, carnality, party spirit within the church. Some sided with Paul, some sided with Apollos, and, and there was bickering, and there was backbiting, and there was infighting, and there was carnality. And Paul says, by this stage, I should have been coming and feeding you with meat, and you should be strong and vibrant and standing up for God. But he says, you're still like babes in Christ. Babes need a lot of attention. Babies cry a lot. Babies sleep a lot. Babies can't stand on their own two feet. Babies can't fend for themselves. And Paul says to this church, ye are yet carnal in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and in the opening verses. And by the time you get to 2 Corinthians, there's been something of a, a reformation within the church. In many respects, they've got their act together a little bit more. And therefore, Paul exhorts them and challenges them. At the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he exhorts them not to look at the things which are seen, but think and consider and meditate and live for and look upon the things that are not seen. The things that we see all around us, they are temporal. They will not last forever. In fact, they will only last for a very, very short time. Therefore, consider the things that are unseen and live for those things which are eternal. Now, God is eternal. Moses said, the eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath, round about, are the everlasting arms. Live for God. The soul is eternal. We can see our bodies, but we cannot see the soul. And the soul is of eternal worth and value. Jesus Christ our Lord said, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? And the soul is of eternal worth and value. And so I believe Paul is saying here, we need to live for God. We need to live for the salvation of the souls of men. As far as we are concerned, heaven is invisible. We cannot see heaven just now. The eye hath not seen, neither hath the ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We cannot see the eternal glory of heaven. It's unseen to us, but it's eternal. And so it is. Hell is eternal as well. And if we could only consider these eternal realities, God, the reality of the soul, the reality of heaven, the reality of hell, and live in light of those things which are eternal. I believe it would revolutionize our own lives, the life of the church, and also the lives of those in our community. And yet the sad truth is, if we're absolutely honest, many of us are not living in light of eternity. We're so bound and we're so tied to this world down here below. And many professing Christians are primarily living for self, living for time, living for pleasure, and living for things that just do not count in light of eternity. And so I want, as I have said, just very loosely to speak on this text this evening, living in light of eternity. Now, as we look at this text tonight, there are three very simple things that I believe lie upon the surface of it as we consider the thinking of the Apostle Paul as he said, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. I believe right on the surface of this text, Paul the Apostle, this man sold out for God, living for Christ, looking forward to meeting the Lord face to face, he is conscious in this verse of the brevity of life. This life in this earth is temporal. It's finite. 
It's not going to last forever in this world as we presently know it. Life in this earth is temporal. You go into the previous verse, verse number 17, Paul is speaking about affliction. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous. And maybe tonight as a believer you are going through a time of trial, adversity, affliction in your life. Paul says our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. What an encouraging text to believers who are struggling. But you can't help but notice in verse 17, Paul is indicating that we are only here for but a moment. And if our lives are filled with affliction, those afflictions are but for a moment. On the flip side of that, if our lives are easy and plain sailing and full of pleasure, those pleasures are but for a moment. Our lives are temporal. We're here but for a moment. And Paul is conscious, therefore, of the brevity of life. Job said our days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Our days are swifter than a post. James said, what is your life? It is even as a vapor. It appeareth for a short time and then vanisheth away. I'm sure most of us can look back to our childhood days and they don't seem all that long ago, but whenever we count up the years, the years have gone by so quickly. Remember my grandparents, whenever I was born, were well into their 70s, passed away. My two grandmothers in their late 90s, whenever I was about late teens, early 20s. And they used to always say, you know, time goes by so quickly. Time flies. And whenever you're at school, it just seems as if time creeps along until you get to the summer holidays and then time goes quickly and then you're back into class and time begins to drag again. But I can remember as a young man, 26 years of age, 2004, sitting in Port Lincoln in South Australia. I'd been there for a couple of years. I was getting ready to come home. It was the month of June. Sitting eating my breakfast at the, the table alone in the Manson, Port Lincoln, South Australia. And it came to my attention, I have left school now for 10 years. And I could hardly believe it. 10 years whenever you're 26 is a long, long period of time. And it, it seemed to have gone in so quickly. And then I can remember in 2014, thinking 10 years ago, I was sitting in Port Lincoln, thinking that I'd left school 10 years ago, and now that means I've left school 20 years ago, and the second 10 years has gone a lot quicker than the first 10 years, and now it's 2024, and I'm looking back thinking 20 years ago I was sitting in Port Lincoln thinking I'd left school 10 years ago, 30 years have gone. And I can still remember that last day of school as if it was yesterday. And in light of it all, what has really been done in my life for the kingdom of God? Some of the great preachers had a very short window of opportunity in which to serve the Savior. Robert Murray McShane of Dundee, 29 years of age, God called him home. He served the Lord, but for six or seven years at best. And yet he turned his city upside down for God. David Brainerd, the, the great missionary to the North American Indians, died at the age of 30. Burned his life out for God. Sometimes felt that his ministry was in vain. And yet God used him in revival amongst the North American Indians. Henry Martin died at the age of 31. Jim Elliot, who went to the Oka Indians in Ecuador said he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose was martyred for his faith at 28 years of age it's remarkable these are young men our Lord Jesus Christ commenced his earthly ministry at 30 I remember being ordained at the age of 30 and getting to the age of 33 and thinking this is all the time that the Lord had in this earth to preach the gospel. Three short years and he changed the entire world and was crucified as a young man at the age of 33. 
And one thing is clear in this chapter, 2 Corinthians 4, Paul is wanting this one short, brief life to count in light of eternity. In the very first verse, he says, as we have received this ministry, we faint not. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to throw the towel in. In verse number three, he says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. We live in a world that's lost, he's saying, and we need to spread the gospel and get the gospel out and make our lives count. In verse 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and your servants for Jesus' sake. Verse number 10 and verse number 11, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in my body, like the hymn writer said, fill with thy spirit, Till all shall see Christ only, Christ always living in me. Verse number 15, all things are for your sakes. Giving his life for others. Spending his life for the good of the church of Jesus Christ. Living, it says at the end of verse 15, for the glory of God. The outward man perishing. Burning his life out for God. The inner life being renewed day after day. Here's a man who's literally giving everything, his every sacred moment spending in publishing the sinner's friend, living for the good of souls, living for the good of the church, living for the glory of Jesus Christ. Friends, tonight we have one life, one short life in a lost world. And sadly, many Christians are going to spend that one short life things that do not matter, things that do not count, maybe even causing strife and division and disunity and heartache amongst the people of God. And the one life that God has given, friends, it's not a dress rehearsal. It's not a trial run. It's the real thing. And it's going by so, so, so quickly. Queen Elizabeth I, whenever she was dying, she had reigned for a good number of years over the great British Empire, an empire which encompassed many parts of the globe, an empire in which the sun never set. And as she was in her deathbed and she was dying, there were rooms around about her filled with hundreds of dresses that were priceless and she would never wear any of them again. And her last words were these, all my millions for just one inch of time. I believe Paul was conscious of the brevity of life are we conscious of how short and how precious the one life that God has given us on this earth is Paul I believe is also conscious of the certainty of death according to verse number 10 he was very much aware of the dying of the Lord Jesus he was living neath the shadow of the cross bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus using his earthly body, his hands, his feet, his heart, his lips, his eyes, his ears to convey to a lost world the message of the cross. But he was also conscious of the certainty of his own death. He says in verse number 16, the outward man is perishing. This old frame, this old tent, this tabernacle that houses the inner man that has been renewed by the Spirit of God and yet the outward man is perishing getting older, not able maybe to do the things that I once did, getting gray and the eyes are getting dim and the, the body racked with aches and pains and the outward man is perishing. And this idea of the word temporal in verse 18 indicates that Paul knew this life as I know it presently in this earth is going to end. Life is brief, but death is absolutely certain. Friends, these are not new truths tonight said to the pastor, Mr. Park, in the way in, the, these messages are going to be very simple. Nothing new to unearth in the scriptures. Just old truths reconsidered. The brevity of life. The certainty of death. The last letter that Paul ever wrote was 2 Timothy. And in the last chapter, 
he said to Timothy, Timothy, I am now ready to be offered. Time of my departure is at hand. Can you say tonight that you're ready? Are you ready as your soul saved tonight? Even as a Christian, are you really ready if the Lord would come? Would you have to try to fix things in your life if you knew the Lord was coming back? Or are you now ready? Watching and waiting, I am now ready to be offered. In 1975, Muhammad Ali fought against Joe Fraser in Manila in the Philippines for the third and final time. They had met twice before. And they had won one fight each. And this was really the decider. It was one of the most brutal boxing matches in the history of the sport. It went for 14 rounds. And Joe Fraser had took so many punches to his face that he could hardly see through his eyes. His eyes were basically shut. And as he was about to stand up and go into the center of the ring to meet Ali for the 15th and final round, his manager, Eddie Futch, put his hand on his shoulder and said, Son, sit down. It's over. But nobody will forget what you have done here tonight. Muhammad Ali saw what was happening and he came out with his hands raised in the air. But in a post-fight press conference, he said, I was on the brink of quitting. If Fraser had come out, I wouldn't have got off my stool. I was ready to quit because I felt that I was in the near room to death. Another three minutes would have killed me. I was in the near room to death. What a statement. And yet every human being can make that statement tonight. We are all in the near room to death. David said there is a step between me and death. I was with a lady earlier and she said, uh, getting on in years, she says, I'm in the departure lounge now. I said to you, you know, we're all in the departure lounge, regardless of what age we are. You go on holidays and there's children and there's young people and there's babes in arms and there's old people as well sitting in the departure lounge. And we're all in the departure lounge and there's just a step. And yet we live somehow in this world as if we're going to live forever. There's a conspiracy of silence about death. Somehow we feel that we are the one exemption and we're never going to die. And because it's so unknown to us and so foreign to us, we can't conceive of what it's going to be like to leave this scene of time. And yet death is absolutely certain. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. John Wesley, whenever he was converted, and that little chapel in Aldersgate Street said his heart was strangely warmed began to really walk with God you know what his prayer was Lord let me not live to be useless let me not live to be useless now that I'm saved and I'm redeemed and I know I'm on my way to heaven and I know that Christ has died for me Lord let my life count let me not live to be useless Back in about the year 2000, I was working in a large factory in Lisburn that employed about 550 or 60 people. And tragically, around that time, there was a number of young men that worked in the factory that were killed on the roads. And around about the Lisburn area, there was quite a number of deaths that year for whatever reason. I remember one evening with a friend in, in, in uh, Port Stewart. His brother said he'll give us a lift home from Port Stewart to County Armagh, and a little small diesel 1.5 litre Peugeot 106. It wasn't turbocharged or anything like that. It was a, a wee car as dead as Hector, and us two big fellas sitting in the back, and the driver in the front, and his girlfriend in the passenger seat. Both of them had been involved in serious road traffic accidents before, but they hadn't learned their lesson. And that young man drove home that night like an absolute maniac. And I remember putting my hand on his shoulder five or six times and speaking to him by name and saying, slow down. But he wouldn't slow down. And the more I told him to slow down, the more it seemed to stir him up to drive even faster. He was tailgating cars at 70 or 80 miles per hour in this little car, overtaking over the brows of hills and round blind corners. And I was convinced that night, I just thought, Lord, we are, there's no way we're going to make it. And I'm going to stand before you and this is the end of the road. I was convinced. I remember going into work the next morning and a big man in the tool room said to me, what's wrong with you? He says, you look all pasty this morning. And I said to him, I thought I was going to die last night. And he says, at least you're ready to go. He knew I was a Christian, but 
In that sense, yeah, ready. But am I really ready to leave this world and to go before the Lord empty-handed? Has my life counted? Has it touched anyone? Has it brought glory to God? Duncan Campbell of the Lewis Revival had a similar experience in, 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 uh, in France in the First World War as his horse was shot out from below him and he fell into the blood and into the mud and was almost critically injured and was lifted by a Canadian soldier and thrown over the back of a horse and was taken to a casualty clearing station and he felt, I'm going now into eternity and I've got nothing to lay down at my Saviour's feet. And he consecrated his life to God in the back of that horse and said, Lord, if you get me through this and you purge me and cleanse me and fill me with your spirit, Lord, I will live a life that counts. The brevity of life, the certainty of death. But surely the overriding truth of verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 4 is the reality of eternity. We look at things which are not seen. We look at those things which are eternal. Paul was living in light of eternity. This one short life that will soon come to an end. I know not where, I know not how, I know not when, but I know that it shall come to an end. And then it's the great eternity. And this world of ours and time itself and world history is but a very small parenthesis in the great eternity. And our lives are a very small parenthesis in world history, just a little speck of time in an ocean, an everlasting, untraceable ocean of eternity. Are our lives going to count in light of eternity? Again, to quote John Wesley, he says, the real value of a thing is the price it will bring in eternity. The real value of a thing is the price that it will bring in eternity. If you could win one soul for Jesus Christ, that would count for all eternity. You could have the biggest house in this locality. You could be the richest man or woman buried in the graveyard. But what is that in light of eternity? It's a solemn thought. J.C. Ryle, the great bishop of Liverpool, said, forever, forever is the most solemn saying in the Bible. Forever is the most solemn saying in the Bible. Thomas Brooks was an old Puritan, and he said, we do all for eternity. These, world of, these lives of ours in this world, they impact eternity. Paul said to Timothy, we brought nothing into this world that is sure that we can take nothing out of it. And oftentimes those who accomplished most in this world were the ones who lived most in light of eternity. Have you ever heard people make statements like, so-and-so is too heavenly minded to be any earthly use? I used to think that's a, that's a queer statement. I tell you tonight, that statement is absolute hogwash. The more heavenly minded and the more eternally minded we are, the more earthly use we will become. The problem is we are so worldly minded, we are no heavenly use. Robert Murray McShane had a, a pocket watch. And on the face of that pocket watch, he had the words, The night cometh when no man can work. It is said that whenever he opened his curtains in the morning to face the light of a new day, he was always thinking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. He used to open his blinds and he used to pray, perhaps today, Lord. And then at night he would go to bed again and having closed his curtains, he would say, perhaps tomorrow, Lord. Always living in light of eternity. Friends, tonight eternity is too late to pray. Eternity is too late to live for Jesus Christ. Eternity is too late to get right with God. Eternity is too late to pray whether you're a sinner in hell praying in repentance or a saint in heaven praying for revival. Eternity is too late to pray. Paul was convinced as to the brevity of life, the certainty of death, the reality of eternity. One thought, one last thought, Bear with me, he was also, I believe, convinced as to the scrutiny of the judgment. 
He doesn't expressly speak about it in this text of Scripture. But he leads on into it in the next chapter. Chapter 5 begins with the word for. And that word is a, a joining word. It joins the content of chapter 4 to chapter 5. And as you read on into chapter 5, Paul speaks about eternity in verse 18 of the previous chapter. Then in verse number 5, continues the same thing. A, a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. And he goes on to speak then in verse number 10 about appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul never seemed to live in the light of the judgment. Now it's true tonight to say that there is such a thing in the Bible as a universal judgment. Romans 14 and 12, every one of us shall give an account of himself before God. You'll give an account of your life and I'll give an account of mine. You'll not give an account for the hypocrites or the people that you disagreed with or the people that made life difficult or the people who were inconsistent in their Christian living or the people that put you off or the people that held you back. You will give an account of your life and I will give an account of mine. Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto man once to die. But after this, after this life, after the experience of death, there's an after this, after this, the judgment. All roads lead to the judgment. You can't escape it. There's an inescapable judgment, the scrutiny of God's judgment throne. We sang the, the hymn earlier, Someday I'll stand before the judgment bar, the quick, the risen dead. The Lord will then make known the record there. Our names will all be read. Someday we're going to stand in judgment. There's such a thing as the judgment of the sinner. Revelation 20 speaks about that. After speaking about the, the thousand years, John says, And I saw a great white throne. It was great. That speaks of majesty. It was white, that speaks of purity. It was a throne, that speaks of authority. I saw a great white throne and one that sat upon it, from whose faith the heaven and the earth fled away. And then before that great throne, he says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And the dead were judged out of the things that were written in those books. I wonder what those books were. I'm sure that the word of God's one of those books. The Lamb's book of life or the book of life is another one of those books. Whosoever is not found written the book of life, cast into the lake of fire. And then maybe a book with your name on it. Do you remember years ago there used to be a, a program on, on television called This Is Your Life? Eamon Andrews, I think, was the host, and then another fella, Parkinson. Can't remember his first name, but he used to surprise people whenever they were about their daily duties. Maybe a sporting star or some political leader or some actress or singer or famous person, and he would just burst in the scene with this big red book, and he'd put it in their hands, and it said in the front of it, this is your life. And generally speaking, it was only the nice things and the good things and the great accomplishments that they'd made that were recorded. But there's a book in heaven with your name on it. And that book's going to be open someday. And if you're not a Christian tonight, you're going to be judged. Look at the judge sitting on a great white throne. The judged. The dead, small and great, stand before God. The books are open. Then the judgment. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast. Cast into the lake of fire. Well, you're going to stand someday in the judgment Will you stand there in your sins before God with the knowledge of the gospel in your head, the truth of the word of God ringing in your ears but not living in your heart, standing before a Savior that died upon a cross and shed his blood and invited you to come and you stand before him in your sins ready to be cast off forever. It's an awful thought. And Christians need to take it to heart that we rub shoulders with people every day in life who are going to be cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Amy Wilson Carmichael had a, a church, a little tin tabernacle, they called it in Belfast, called the Old Welcome. She was an accomplished poet. She was an accomplished writer. 
One day she told a story about a, a kind of a, a vision, if you like, a vision of her heart, not a vision that she saw with her eyes, but a vision of her heart, of the state, the deplorable <coughs> state of the church as she seen it. Sitting in the long grass on a bright summer's day, sitting in little groups and little circles and little cliques, plucking daisies out of the grass and talking the one to the other and making daisy chains and seeing who is the longest daisy chains while multitudes walk past them blindfolded over the precipice of a great cliff to their destruction. And she says, that is just like the church of Jesus Christ. We're making daisy chains while a world is going to hell. Leonard Ravenhill had a chapter in one of his books, I think it's the book, Revival God's Way. It's called, Hell Burns While the Church Sleeps. There's a judgment universally. There's a judgment for the sinner, but there's also, friends, a judgment for the saint. Paul is writing to believers here in 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We, including himself, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema. We have become so accomplished and so accustomed to hearing about such and such a person died, they were a Christian, they've gone to heaven. Somebody's died, they're with Christ, it's far better. They're in the arms of Jesus, they're no longer suffering, they're at peace now, they're in a better place. And all of those things, of course, for a child of God are true, they are. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. But sometimes we forget that there is a day coming whenever believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I tell you tonight, as I get older and as I look back on my life and so much of it has been wasted on things that don't matter and I think about the future, how long or how short that might be and the darkness of the age in which we're living in, standing at the judgment seat of Christ before the King of kings and Lord of lords and giving an account of my prayer life, my stewardship, my service, my motives. Friends, I tell you tonight, it's not all that endearing a prospect. I think it's going to be a fearful thing. I'm not looking forward to it at all. I'm looking forward to seeing my Savior. I'm looking forward to heaven. I'm looking forward to glory. But there's certainly a certain level of fear standing at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. What have you done with me? What have you done for me? What have you done through me? What have you done with the gospel? This treasure that I gave you and you carried it about in Northern Ireland and maybe at other places for short periods of time, for 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, you carried that treasure around in a jar of clay. Did you share it with a lost and perishing world? If your gospel's hid, it is hidden to them that are lost. To stand before the King of Kings. Now that great judgment is spoken of in detail, I believe, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Where Paul says in verse number 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord is the foundation for salvation for heaven, for home, for assurance. Praise God those who are saved are standing upon that sure foundation that no man can destroy. But it goes on to say, it speaks in verse number 10, we are building upon that foundation. That's a verb. Building upon a foundation. Working according to a plan. The builder gets out the architect's drawings or gets out the old blueprints and he works according to that plan and he builds upon a foundation that has been laid by somebody else. And we are building tonight in light of eternity upon a foundation and that involves activity, action and industry. The prophet Amos said, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Verse number 12 speaks about the materials that we can build with. If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, that's the first group. And then there's another group, wood, hay, or stubble. There's a big difference between gold and silver and precious stones and wood, hay, and stubble. Wood has a certain level of value. Hay has a little less value. Stubble has got very little value at all. But wood, hay, and stubble are things that are seen on the surface. Gold, and silver and precious stones are things that are found deep, deep down below the surface. 
And I believe the scrutiny of God's judgment will not just be our outward life, but maybe the, the hidden man of the heart, our thought lives, our prayer lives, our motives, our faithfulness, our affections, our devotions, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, the things that come from the inner man, the things of the heart. Verse number 13 speaks about this great judgment. Every man's work shall be made manifest. It's all going to be brought to light. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. It's going to be manifest what we did, how we did it, why we did it, and if we did it at all. The Bible says that God is going to judge the secrets of our hearts. This is the great bema, the judgment of believers, and it's going to be revealed by fire. Now, if you put a match to wood, hay, or stubble, it'll ignite its combustible material. It'll be burned away. It'll be reduced to ashes. Gold and silver and precious stones are materials that can abide the fire. And whenever we stand someday in the judgment throne of God before the judgment seat of Christ, God is going to put a match, if you like, to the lives that we have built upon the foundation that we profess to stand upon. And it's all going to be put through the fire. And friends, the things that do not matter, the things that are temporal, the things that are seen, the things that are visible will be burned away in an instant. But the gold and the silver and the precious stones will remain. Those are the things that are eternal. The things that are done with a right heart attitude. For the glory of God and for the furtherance of the gospel. And for the good of our neighbor. And for the benefit of lost souls. Those, I believe, are the things that God is looking for tonight. If any man shall suffer loss, it says, if any man's work, verse 15, shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss. He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Paul's saying there are some, and they'll get into heaven by the skin of their teeth. Absolutely nothing really to show as far as a life of surrender and service, a life that counts is concerned. Others, it says, will receive a reward according to verse number 14. I'm not sure tonight what your eschatology is. I don't know tonight what your view is of the millennium, if it's literal, it's pre-mill, post-mill, a-mill. I'm not concerned about those things tonight. But I don't know about you, but it says in Revelation 21, verse number 4, God shall wipe away all tears from off their eyes. It's my conviction that whenever God does that, that happens after the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. I believe we will have tears at the judgment seat. Whenever we look in his face, we will wish we had given him more. When we see the print of the nails in his hands, we'll wish we had given him more. Whenever we see that we're entering into an eternal world and life was not a dress rehearsal, we'll wish we had given him more. You cannot and I cannot and we will not be able to fix our lives, our testimonies, our relationships at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. In the place where the tree falleth, there shall it lie. A life that counts. I don't want to stand before the Savior. A life full of regrets. What could have been done? What might have been done? What should have been done? What ought to have been done? But it wasn't done because I was so concerned with my name, my will, my kingdom. The wood, the hay, the stubble, the things that the world sees and the world holds dear. The things that are temporal. And I lived for those things. And I said I was a Christian and I took my place as a Christian. But I didn't really live to the glory of God. And in light of eternity, laboring for things that don't matter. Paul had the right perspectives in life. Living in light of eternity. C.T. Studd, I'm sure you've heard of him. You've maybe read some of his books, heard his life story. He was a, a cricketer. He was one of the Cambridge Seven. He had the world at his feet. He was intelligent. He was successful. He was athletic. He came from a wealthy background. The world was at his feet. 
And through a process of events, he came to faith in Jesus Christ. He married a girl called Priscilla Stewart who came from Lisburn. Her father owned a large linen mill that was there until the 1980s. The house that she lived in is still there. It's a solicitor's office today. Whenever they get married, Priscilla said, we have to surrender and give God everything. And all of the money that they were granted for their wedding gift, she gave it all away. And her husband was challenged that the sacrifice and the sacrificial living and giving of his new bride so much so that he went on to say and write those remarkable words only one life and it will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last a life that counts living in light of eternity the brevity of life the certainty of death the reality of eternity the scrutiny of the judgment Dear friends, God promises to equip and to enable and to bless those who live their lives for him. Let's do it before it's too late. Your attention tonight has been wonderful. I want to thank you for listening. And I'll ask your pastor, Reverend Park, just to close the meeting. I often we have used the expression about living with eternity's values in view. And that's what this meeting is been about tonight. I want to thank Mr. Higginson for the word and uh, maybe take it to heart, act upon it, not just be the hearer but the doer of the word. And there is a hymn we should sing at least part of it in closing 596. Someday the silver cord will break. Never a time that I sing about this hymn and as I was choosing it today for tonight's meeting it brought me back 14 years ago we were over in the minister's study with our brother Bill Woods and at that stage he had been 50 years in Brazil and he wanted to put together the DVD but he was relating the story of Fred Orr and Fred and Ina going out to the mission field and on the way to their destination traveling up the Amazon River or one of the uh, tributaries of the Amazon uh, she took ill with a fever and a few days later, she died. And as he was relating that story, he wanted an appropriate hymn to be played while he was telling the story. And this is the one that our brother Bill chose. And how true it is, that silver cord is going to break one day. And we're going to see the Lord maybe live in the light of that day.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies to us tonight, for speaking to us, for opening up the word, and for the challenge of living in the light of that great day, uh, setting aside those things that are really not important, not to be so taken up with them that we miss out on what the real business is. Lord, help us to labor for the master from the dawn to the setting sun. Help us, Lord, to do your work and to do it well in the capacity and the ability that you've given to us. Bless the church. Bless every child of God that's here and every believer listening in uh, to this meeting tonight, Lord. And may our souls be stirred and may we go from this place determined to live in that, the light of that day. Lord, we're going to die. We're going to stand before God at the judgment. And what shall we give? What shall we offer? What shall we say to him on that day? We know that we will say, I wish I'd given him more. And so, Lord, dismiss us now with your word ringing in our hearts and in our ears and help us, Lord, to live for your glory, for Christ's sake. Amen.